my name is Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at, at CSIS. And we're going to be talking today about the Millennium Development Goals Achievement Fund's contributions to Latin American development. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have the, the Kingdom of Spain as a sponsor, but also, more importantly, our friends at the Millennium UNDP's Millennium Development uh, Challenge Fund here, Achievement Fund, who helps co-sponsor this. Uh, we have Mr. Bruno Moro, who is the director of the Millennium Development Goals Achievement Fund here. I also want to recognize the presence of my friend, Ambassador Hill Casares, who's here as well. Thank you for coming, Ambassador. Um, and we have uh, many uh, friends, and friends and family here from CSIS who's he who are here, and, and many of you from the Washington Policy Community that are here. So it's really, I think, great. I think we had a very interesting lunch discussion uh, with a number of representatives from embassies uh, from Latin America before this event, and some of them are still here. Um, talking about the changed landscape for development from t the year 2000 when, when the Millennium Development Goals were put together to the year 2013. It's a very different conversation. It's far more complex. There's a greater recognition of the role of the private sector. Uh, there's high le higher levels of the role of trade in, in development, the uh, conversations about South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation, and the incredible progress that's been made in many parts of Latin America, while at the same time and many development and social challenges still in the region. And so we talked a lot about the paradoxes of development in the region and what the role of traditional cooperation is, whether it's bilateral or multilateral. And we know it's, we know it's changing. So we've got two um, very uh, qualified people to share with us uh, their perspectives on this uh, very interesting set of paradoxes, but also to share a little bit about the role of the, the Millennium Challenge Fund uh, in Latin America. And I also think a little bit we should be thinking about this within the context of the post-2015 goals, uh, which are in the process of being debated and discussed as we speak. So I think uh, the rich experience of the last six years since the Spanish government made this strategic investment of a billion euros at the time uh, to support uh, the MDGs to achieve the Millennium Development Goals through the United Nations system, I think is something that uh, we have a lot to learn from. But we also have a lot to learn from the great progress of many countries in the region. And so we're very, very fortunate to have with us Ambassador Harold Forsyth, who represents the, uh, the, the country of Peru. And if you haven't been to Peru recently, I highly recommend that you go. I was there 10 years ago. Uh, I was there then two months ago. It is another country. It's one of the reasons I got into the development business. I find Peru to be inspiring. I think what's happened in the country of Peru is unbelievable, or certainly in the, in the city of Lima. Uh, so I think that we have so much to learn from the successes of countries like Peru, and certainly bilateral cooperation, and certainly multilateral cooperation like the MDG Achievement Fund have been uh, supporting actors in that process. They're not the central actors. We don't do development out of development cooperation. We're cooperating. We are supporting actors. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Ambassador Forsyth, and then we're going to hear from Mr. Bruno Moro. Ambassador Forsyth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Bruno. It's, it's, it's a great possibility for myself to be here representing Peru in such a prestigious institution, especially if we're going to talk about something which is very dear to us, which, is, which are the Millennium Goals and uh, the tremendous success that we have enjoyed toward that path. And of course, our special gratitude to the Ambassador of Spain here and through him to the government of Spain. Uh, it's something wonderful to be considered an inspiration, so thank you for your words. But at the same time, just a few moments ago, we were having a a short round table, and we were discussing about the need of the concept of cooperation to, to have some evolution according to the new realities of our region. Yes, it's true. We're leaving the condition of low-income countries, and these new challenges beginning for us, middle-income countries, and even high-income countries in some specific cases. That poses a challenge. And uh, we're ready to, and we're open to listen for new options. And uh, we have to, to reconsider and to redefine what cooperation has meant for us in the last few years and be prepared to face the future. 
I will share with you briefly a few of the most important things that we have achieved in regards to this uh, Millennium Goals and in regards to the corporations that the fund established uh, directly to this endeavor. Social inclusion and poverty eradication are top priorities for the government of Peru. And this goal, in, this goals imply that the state not only promotes economic growth, but also social development. Peru has experienced remarkable economic development, as evidenced by a sustained average growth rate of 6.7% over the last decade. The economic, monetary, and fiscal discipline exercised by Peru has allowed its GDP to expand th threefold, while inflation ranks among the lowest rates in Latin America. Altogether, the main drivers of this substantial growth are productivity, international trade integration, and clear guidelines for foreign investment. In the fiscal year, this current year, the national budget grew by 13.5%, doubling the budget size approved in 2006. The current budget, in effect, spends more than half of its appropriations on actions that have social and productive benefits like, for instance, education, health, social projects, and so on. Even before 2015, Peru had fulfilled various Millennium Development Goals, such as reduction in the poverty rate from 54.8% in 2001 to 27.8% in 2011. Reduction in the incidence of extreme poverty from 16.4% in 2004 to 11.2% in 2007. Reduction in child malnutrition from 25.4% in 2000 to 15.2% in 2011. In 2009, chronic malnutrition decreased and reached the goal proposed for 2015. 18.3%. In 2011, average student attendance in elementary education reached almost an equal parity between sexes and fulfilled the goal. 93% girls versus 93.1% boys. The infant mortality rate for children aged 0 to 1 declined from 55 per thousand live births in 1990 to 16 per thousand live birth in 2011. In 2010, the infant mortality rate decreased by two thirds and reached the goal level proposed for 2015, which is 18%. And in 2011, the mortality rate in children under five registered 25 deaths for children under five per 11 Per, sorry, per 1,000 live births. The mortality rate decreased by 73.1% and reached the goal level in 2009, which is 26%. In other areas, MDGs are almost completed. In the last 10 years, the school enrollment rate has fluctuated between 91.5% in 2002 and 96.1% 96, 96 in 2011. Peru is only 3.9% apart from the 100% 100 elementary school enrollment goal. Efforts to eradicate illiteracy have almost reached completion. The, Ill the literacy rate of Peruans between 15 and 24 has fluctuated between 96% and 98% in the last decade. We are within 1.6% points to reach 100% by 2015. So we're getting closer, as you can see. The goal of reducing maternal mortality by two thirds is about to be reached. Maternal mortality fell from 265 to 93 deaths per 100,000 births between 1990 and 2010. Maternal mortality must still be reduced in only 27 deaths per 100,000 live births in order to achieve the goal proposed by 2015. Prenatal care coverage has also increased from 84% to 95% in the same period. 
we're only 5.6% points short of achieving the 100% goal by 2015. Similarly, the percentage of women in reproductive age using contraception has increased from 68% to 75% in 2011. And the percentage of people who have access to drinking water has improved from 70% in 2004 to 76% in 2011. Peru is only 4.5 percentage points of achieving the goal set for the year 2015, which is 81.3%. Furthermore, the state is developing an STI awareness policy to reduce HIV AIDS transmission rates and has, and, and has significantly expanded coverage of antiretroviral treatment to those affected. Progress has been made in terms of legislation on environmental issues and climate change. Peru has de developed a policy of economic liberalization and has signed several free trade agreements with major countries and economic blocs. In 2006, Spain contributed 528 million euro, that is $710 million, toward the MDG effort. The Achievement MDGs Fund was established by the United Nations. Latin America and the Caribbean is the region which receives the most resources from NDGF. Four joint programs have been implemented in Peru. These programs have a budget of approximately $18 million for the reduction of poverty, hunger, and food insecurity. These programs include the implementation of actions in national, regional, and district levels. Such implementation has been exercised in the poorest departments of Peru. The programs developed in Peru concretely are improving nutrition and food security for the Peruvian child, a capacity building approach, budget 600,000, integrated and adaptive management, sorry, six million dollars, integrated and adaptive management of environmental resources and climatic risks in high Andean micro watersheds, budget 3,900,000. Inclusive creative industries, an innovative tool for alleviating poverty in Peru, budget, five million. Employment creation and MS, MS, MSEs for youth and management of juvenile labor migration, budget, three million dollars. In conclusion, it can be noted that the Achievement MDG, MDGs Fund in Peru has been extremely positive for the following reasons. It has been a significant contribution of 18 million programs 18 million dollars programs aimed towards greater nutrition, environmental protection, MSC promotion, and youth opportunities. These programs have complemented the efforts of the government on social issues in Peru. These programs have also focused on the poorest regions and more vulnerable demographics. These programs have also been focused on the rural sector where the largest social disparities are found. Numerous local communities and municipal governments have incorporated into their local agendas interests and concerns about environmental issues. A consortium of artisans and four collectives have been created. A youth employment sector plan has been created, and in some regions, a regional youth employment plan. And I finish by saying that a Wawawasi labor pilot program, which is especially aimed for the care of children, has been implemented. And in effect, this program has benefited more than 437 young mothers. So, young mothers. So this is a, this is only a simple glimpse of what's going on, and that probably this particular results probably explain the impressions that you had visiting my country. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've been, I've, I've been around the international development business for 11 years, and I've, you, you, you want to hear statistics like that? You don't hear good news stories like that very often. That we're in the bad news business. This is a great, this is great news. This is inspiring stuff. This is very important stuff. It's about the role of the private sector. It's about taking a long-term view. Yes, the role of, of, of international development cooperation has been important, but gosh, it is 
inspiring stuff. This is why people get into the development businesses to hear things like the sorts of statistics that the ambassador read. This is really fabulous and it's very inspiring. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Bruno, we've heard a little bit about how the uh, Millennium Development uh, Achievement Fund uh, of, the, of the UN system has made a contribution in Peru, but perhaps you might share a little bit of a, broad, a bigger picture about how the MDG Achievement Fund, what it is, how it's made a contribution more broadly, and what the innovations are, and perhaps some of the lessons that we can take away in this broader conversation about 2015. Uh, many thanks, Daniel. It is a pleasure to be here, Ambassador Forsyth, <laughs> Ambassador Gil Casares, Paloma, all present here. It's really a pleasure to be here today to share some of the issues that uh, Daniel has mentioned. And I will go briefly with you, not only uh, about what uh, we are doing with these funds, but also and with this development proposal, with this mechanism, but also how we are doing it. Because uh, these two elements are very critical. Uh, it's important to establish and agree on what to do, but also it's important to uh, identify the best way of how to do it to achieve uh, the desirable impact. So I don't know, we can go ahead with a quick uh, presentation. If, we, if the slides are not on, I can still go ahead just a little bit. Well, anyway, I will... It is from there. Do you want me to? No, can. Essentially, uh, this fund is called MDG Achievement Funds. The, the title, the same title gives you an idea that uh, uh, the fund wanted to have an action to accelerate the achievement of the MDGs. When it was established in 2007, there was this feeling that uh, we are not progressing fast enough. So we do it to do something uh, very important, very strategic and very catalytic to accelerate the achievement because otherwise would have been a tremendous, tremendous uh, setback for the development community. Having agreed in 2000 on a critical uh, development priority globally and not been able in two and two years to advance significantly, significantly toward the target that we established in 2000. There was a, a, a prime minister who said, okay, we agreed nicely for the first time it is very important to the most important uh, international agreement for, for a concern, development cooperation policy ever on eight objectives. But how, so it would take 20 years to achieve those objectives. How many years to reduce poverty of the second half, which is not included in those 40 years? So that would be tremendous. So at least uh, not having the capacity to, uh, guaranteeing that we have the capacity to achieve this objective would be important. So, uh, in 2007, the government of Spain, with a very courageous initiative, established a fund uh, with amount of 900 million uh, to promote the uh, uh, Millennium Development Goal. It, the fund, at the end of its activity, it will terminate uh, its activity this year, supports 130 joint programs on fi in 50 countries, almost. Uh, uh, a little bit more than 30% of the funds and 30% of the total amount of joint program were in Latin America. So there was a privilege for Latin America. It is interesting because Latin America, we have heard, is uh, mainly middle income, but 90% uh, of the poor in Latin America are coming from middle income. So this is extremely important to see how we have to address this phenomenon. The program area, I eight program areas within the uh, mandate of the, a millennium, uh, um, of the Millennium Development Goal and related ch children, food nutrition, gender equality, women empowerment, climate change, environment, youth employment, democracy, democratic economic governance, development in the private sector, conflict prevention, and culture and development. So, but as I mentioned before, this is fine to agree on what to do, but how to do it. And then we can go to the next slide. For the first time, uh, this initiative put in, uh, into one place, in one package, four elements that are very critical. And they are element critical to uh, the policy 
of international policy for development in the last 20 years. First, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goal. We are fine. Second is uh, how to do it. So they promoted what we call the Paris Declaration. The Paris Declaration indicated, approved by all international cooperation, donor countries, recipient countries, it was internationally agreed, civil society participated in all one, that we need to have harmonization, simplification, ownership, uh, participation, and the fifth one I always forget. Uh, but essentially, is you have to work together, pulling resources together, and not a different type of a development agency working everybody on their own without looking at each other. So let's pull everything together. So the mechanism implied to have a process that guaranteed all these five elements, and we will go about that. And the third element was to promote that since the, uh, uh, the articulating agent, uh, the channel of this fund was the UN, essentially a one UN. We never had a fund that really a mechanism requested the whole agency, the whole agency in the very several countries to work together. And the fourth element, which is connected to this one, it, this is, if you consider the first interagency for, for development ever. As generally, the fund or the financing for development is bilateral, a country, an agency. We don't have a mechanism. We haven't established interagency type of funding. This was the first time they requested the UN to promote programs with different agencies in line with the uh, reform of the UN promoted by the Secretary General. That is extremely interesting because who is the actor, who is the factor that allow this working together is the resident coordinator. So it was the first fund who really empowered the resident coordinator to coordinate the rest of the activity of the agency. The resident coordinator, the country level, usually have a lot of responsibility, no authority. So there is very, it's very difficult for them to coordinate without any authority. Being the political responsible of the result of this program, that gave the resident coordinators the capacity to pull together the agencies. So this was the first, the four elements that I think would be interesting to study in the context of the future, the post-2015 what will happen in the discussion. So we have to discuss in the future to renovate, review, comp complement the uh, new agenda for development up 2030, but also the how we do it. These funds, these mechanisms give important lessons on how to do it, pursuing and insisting on the positive indication the international community give, gave to us in the last uh, 20 years for concern the how to do it, the coordination, the complementarity, the ownership, and so on and so forth. So if we continue, uh, Daniel, we have, uh, okay, uh, what is, uh, this mechanism is allowing is to address what we call multidimensional, uh, multidimensional challenges in development. What, one of the difficulties of, of not working really together is that we address only one aspect of the problem. I give an example of uh, emergency. When you have an emergency, all the emergency uh, uh, actors intervene. But if they're not coordinated, for example, they establish shelter. Two weeks later come an, uh, the agency establishing the water supply. Four months later comes somebody to reactivate the economic activity and so on and so forth. That essentially what the result is that uh, all these inputs will get lost, because if you put the shelter without water, they will not go there. If you put the water without economic activity and the shelter, you still will not go there. So the essential element is to plan together. That's why these funds are forcing the actors to work together in an intersectoral way, allow to have this uh, uh, result. And on top of it, avoid overlap, duplication, increase coordination, increase the comparative advantage of that one. How they did it? They didn't do it alone, the agencies. It was a multiple level, in the next, in the next slide. So first it was the national government uh, in the mechanism. Then there was the local government. Then in, involved there were the local beneficiaries. Then the donors, agencies, 
uh, and the agencies involved under the coordination of the resident coordinator. So that's allowed, even if the funds, important but little in the total fund for cooperation, to have an impact on policy. They established, if you consider for government, is also difficult. They don't have the culture to work together. You might may confirm me. You have Ministry of Education, they work on education. They don't look so much at what Minister of Health is doing or Minister of Housing is doing. So there is a culture, silos culture, in any country, developing and developing. They're working together, focuses on the territory and the target of, uh, beneficiary is the challenge that through this fund, they make it we allow to overcome. And when it was proved successful, the government adopted it to other regions, which is upstream policy essentially. So from local pilot to scaling up. Uh, let's go ahead with another. Okay, very good. Um, I, uh, there are other consequences for the sake of time. I will, these are implication of working uh, in a nice coordinating way at the, uh, uh, the local level. I would, I would like to skip that one and push to uh, the element of uh, um, ownership, which is very important. With this allowed, uh, you can see a nice uh, relationship between what is central government ownership, local institution ownership, and citizen ownership, which brings a democratic component to the whole development process because the citizen can make uh, the government accountable of what they agreed upon and can make the cooperation accountable of that. This is the beauty of things because uh, 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 we, 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 we were able to experience that uh, at a different, uh, different level. Uh, promoting the local ownership is particularly important because you know that uh, there is a saying that government changes, but people stay. So this is particularly important because they are, if, if we uh, create a culture of accountability on the promise for development, the people and the territory where the people the problem are will replicate the request of being accountable on promises on the future uh, actor. So there is a government actor. There is a level of continuity and creating capacity at the multiple level. Uh, if we continue, what I mentioned already, there is a, the uh, interest on the civil society participation. What we uh, what the mechanisms allow to do that is that uh, the participation was really across all the elements, not only in uh, uh, deciding how to uh, design the program, but also at the level of the mechanisms of monitoring uh, and evaluation of the uh, progresses, and also in creating certain capacity at national level to have a civil society active in monitoring and evaluation. So it was really quite complete and uh, involved uh, uh, different levels of government and society. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the funds constituted the first incentive to work together because it was meant to be interagency. This is, if we think of the future, if we think of a fund that will promote the, uh, the uh, MDGs of the future, uh, we definitely will have to think of uh, a new window, which is a funding window, which pulls together funding from different sources, but goes only to interagency multisectoral activities. Um, there is an element of promoting the UN coherence, which is important. I would like to say modernity is not the most important thing, but it is important because uh, we more and more are uh, considered as an element that helps to put all things together. There is a cohesion on different acts of cooperation, which is allowed essentially by the UN representing as an institution that has the flag of all the country and of the policy of the world. So I uh, uh, would skip the two, two, two slides. And I will conclude this part of the presentation, saying that uh, we uh, undertook some specific case study that uh, supposedly will be able to show uh, that uh, whether the uh, uh, condition and the uh, premises we started 
uh, with uh, were uh, uh, fulfilled, and we think that they were. So we have Colombia, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, Nicaragua, Philippines, and Serbia. All these uh, were dissected, and we proved there that all these uh, hypotheses were really positive, were uh, fulfilled, and essentially uh, are putting this program in the capacity to have an influence at the policy level much higher because they will be uh, from a pilot, a small program, or relatively small program, will be really translated in national policy level uh, for uh, national action. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I, I was just struck by the um, some of some of the themes that came out of the presentations. One was on the issue of uh, local uh, local projects to bring them to scale up. Could you just talk a little bit more about that, that Bruno? And then I, I wanted to ask the ambassador if he could um, just share with us a little bit his experience about why when people want to understand when why why Peru has been so successful. What is it about? What is it about? 10 years or 15 is there been is there is there when you think about the two or three factors that have been sort of critical to Peru success over the last 10 or 15 years what what are those two or three two or three success two or three keys to the success but while you're thinking about that I'm going to ask Mr. Morrow to to answer this question about this issue of local to scale up because I think this okay. is going to be one of the themes that's going to come out of the the conversation going into the in the post 2015 discussion no, that, that is extremely important, uh, and, and exactly in the post-2015 uh, discussion, but it's important also for the reflection around how to make uh, relevant public policy. What we have perceived is that, general, particularly in Latin America, but in general now, there is a, a widespread agreement that uh, government and do, are doing, are proposing, are designing good a social policy, a good economic policy. In Latin America, there is small differences by everybody see each other. Colombia see Brazil and Chile, and Mexico, and vice versa. Uh, so uh, they have a change also. But essentially, these are policy that are designed at the national level, technocratically, technically very well. There is certain participation of different actors. But we see the phenomenon of Latin America, they don't filter down, they don't trickle down as they wished and they pretended. Latin America has, is, the, govern, is the, con the continent, is the region which has the, one of the highest growth, which goes along with increase on extreme poverty or exclusion. So there is something that is that not allowing the trickling down the benefit of the increased growth. We are overcoming that. The example of Peru is interesting. They are finding out, they are discovering what are the, uh, the barriers for this uh, exchange. But uh, one of the barriers is that uh, you cannot make only national good uh, development policy, social policy. You have to start looking and where the policy will fall down. So you have to go to the bottom. And then you'll see that for a cultural reason, indigenous, that policy doesn't work. For another reason, Africa descent will not work. We have excluded fringe in the, in the outskirts of the city that are a mix of culture or difficult to get to, uh, uh, don't get the benefit. We have a new culture that comes from the mix of different population that gets down around the cities. So you have to get, I make an exercise that goes down. You make a, an exercise with those population we establish the mechanism that works, and then you adopt it national level, which involves also creating a new culture in the civil servant of the country, a new form to approach the beneficiary, and not only approach, to give the beneficiary the status of actors, and to involve them and be part of the whole exercise. That is essentially. So how it is done? Well, when you are go going to the territory, they will not look when they feel or something that they need, or the Ministry of Education, or the Ministry of uh, uh, Health, or what they, they, they see the needs of the territory in a unique and comprehensive way. So they would need to have these services all in one time, all together, otherwise they will not work well. 
Otherwise, they will not complement each other, or on the contrary, they will affect each other. If you have some good education, you don't have health, or vice versa, this will not work in the territory. And if you don't have, at the same time, a promotion of your local industry, local activity, economic activity, employment, you have migration, or you have the presence of uh, illegal or criminal actors and so on and so forth on delinquency. So this is going to the bottom, making them participate, and from the bottom, check whether the relevance of the national policy is okay. So it's from local to up to down. This is the concept. Okay, Ambassador, tell us, tell us how, how, how has this happened? How, what, how, because, the, you know, like I said, the, when we hear those statistics, those are not the statistics you hear every day. It's really, I mean, obviously, nothing, it's not all perfect, but I think you, you have really quite a case study to share with us. Please, Ambassador. Yes, thank you, Daniel. I think it's a complex issue. Uh, we, let me go back a little in history. We had a so-called revolutionary process led by the military from 1968 to 1980. So uh, the armed forces in my country began with the so-called structural changes. Uh, probably their intentions were good. I have a personal good feeling toward those years. But in 1980, there was a widespread demand to recover democracy, not only in Peru, but in every Latin American country. And the, we were not an exception. So uh, a former president, Fernando Belaunde, won elections that year. And uh, he came back to power with very good intentions again for the second time. But the situation had changed dramatically. We had something that we did not know before, debt, external debt. And we were part of this terrible scandal, which was the so-called Latin American debt crisis. But not only that, we began feeling the effects of wrong and very bad economic policies that had been implemented for so many years. So we began in Peru feeling uh, the real consequence of economic crisis in the interior of the country. And at the same time, we began facing a new enemy, terrorism with the so-called shining path, Sendero Luminoso. But not only that, democracy was young, was new, and was very weak in order to face all this tremendous pressure. So in five more years, President Belaunde finished his term with a good reputation, but the country was in a very, very bad shape. That opened the door to populism. So we had a government which led populist policies from 1985 to 1980. That did not work, to 1990, sorry. That did not work, of course. That did not work. And the country, in a blind desperation, political parties were destroyed. We have no cold, uh, cold War anymore. And uh, in a blind desperation, the, the country chose probably a wrong path again, the, the so-called Fujimori government. And then a dictatorship was implemented in a year and a half or so. And uh, that dictatorship, la dictatorship lasted for 10 years and four months. I cannot deny that the sound economic policies began to be applied during those years, especially at the beginning. And of course, the result was good. But at the same time, we had no democracy, we had no freedom, and we had widespread corruption. Fortunately, democracy came back in the year 2000. And since then, we have had even four constitutionally elected governments as the one we have today. And these governments have, <coughs> have had, and they still have, the current government, a very clear priority. The economic policy <coughs> should be stable and sound. So the principle of uh, 
free market, fiscal responsibility is there. And we are being extremely careful with that. So we decided not to be crazy anymore about economy. So economy is a serious issue. And uh, I'm very glad that President Umala is extremely respectful of that path. And uh, at the same time, we have been able to reach all these impressive results with democracy and with freedom. And Bruno mentioned something interesting, bureaucracy, the civil servants. We have been able to create, to establish a tremendously qualified group of men and women in the public service, especially in the areas of trade, economy, social inclusion, poverty. And of course, that pays. Uh, as we were discussing before this meeting began, this is wonderful, of course, but we still face problems. The most serious one is probably inequality, the most serious one. And we have to do something about it because we are a tremendously uh, popular region in the world because of our economic success. But at the same time, it is well known that we are the most unequal region in the world. So, so our situation in regard to that is even worse than the situation of Africa. And at the same time, there is, there is a scoundrel which, is which has been extremely aggressive, and that is crime. And, of course, drug trafficking. So let's do something about it. And uh, we will, of course, succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've got some, we'd, I'd like to open the floor to questions. I know there, I have a number of, of friends and colleagues here are very thoughtful. Um, so I think we have uh, microphones. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on this gentleman here with the, with the blue shirt and the red tie. If you could just identify yourself and, and yes. Is it on? Can yep. I, okay. I'm Eric Leaf, I'm with the Stimson Center. Um, thanks very much, this is a great event. I, um, I've learned a lot already. Um, two, two quick areas, one of them is there was, a, there was a brief reference to innovative financing in the presentation. Could you give some examples? Innovative financing means different things to a lot of us. Could you give some examples? Does this mean public-private partnerships? Does it mean loan guarantees? Does it mean, uh, what, is, what does it mean? And the second one is the financial, the current financial situation of the fund. Uh, in other words, from the fund's point of view, what do you fund in the way of innovative financing? And uh, second, let me, the, why don't we bunch a couple questions the, together? The second, so. the, the second one is, what's the current financial status of the fund? Which means, um, what's its current balance? Are there other contributors besides Spain? Uh, what does is, what is the situation look like going forward? Thank you. Let me just see if there's, I see a gentleman back there as well. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. My name is uh, Ovi and I manage the Global Innovation through Science and Technology, a global program that focuses on uh, fostering early stage technology entrepreneurship. My question is for Ambassador Forsyth, how do you see the role of early stage technology entrepreneurship in actually contributing to the prosperity of uh, your country and also if you have any comments about the launch of Startup Peru? How does he, could you? Uh, let me, I think I heard their question, which is how, you, uh, this gentleman's with the, uh, with emerging, techn and a te emerge, emerging Technologies Fund, and how does Peru see emerging technologies as part of the success of, of Peru? Is that, is that, does that capture your question? Yes, it's both for the past, but also for the future. I know that Peru has, uh, is now launching Startup Peru, which is in a way similar to Startup Chile, yeah. which is an initiative started by Chile several Startup years ago. Peru. So about the past, but also about the future, what yeah, sorts of initiatives the there are. Technology and startups in the future of the economy. Okay, why don't, Amb Ambassador, why don't we start with you on that, on that question, if, if you would, and then maybe we might have uh, Bruno answer the first question. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you, not being an expert in that area, of course, is that science and technology has been abandoned for so many years in Peru. Uh, not only that, investment in that particular area has been very poor. And not only that, our best men and women in the scientific field and the technological field have left the country. And there is a 
there is a, 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 an incredible matter also. We have great universities forming these people, but the, the labor market in Peru is very weak in order to get them, so they leave. And uh, there, is a, there is a trend now in order to reverse that. So there is a so-called CONCITEC. Uh, there is a program that has been implemented that you have mentioned, and the government is trying to, to invest funds in order to develop uh, research in these specific fields, uh, science and technology, and, and of course, relate these areas to our processes of development. I don't think it's, a, it's an easy task, but perhaps we're in the right track. Thank you. Bruno, if you would, the, the questions from the gentleman from the Stimson Center. Yeah. At, at two level, uh, uh, for concern financing innovative initiative or in innovative financing, there are two. One is at the level of the mechanism in the fund itself. What it shows uh, was that, is that uh, the indication coming from the Paris Declaration when you establish mechanisms for uh, uh, f development financing uh, is absolutely economical uh, for the economy scale to pull resources together. So the indication is let's uh, do a great exercise to agree on objectives, agree on results, agree on how to do it, but pull the things together because otherwise you multiply your administrative uh, setup for, uh, to administer each piece of the fund and will have a tremendous overhead on, 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 on those funds. That is one. The second is more related to the fact that initiatives like the private sector established for uh, a development cooperation something that maybe is not tremendously uh, new for concern the specificity, but is new to put together private sector fund initiatives, government promoting private sector, and, uh, and, uh, and the external cooperation the coming from the fund. They were. So there, was, uh, there were initiatives uh, uh, put together, the capacity of the cooperation, uh, funding from the state and from the private sector together through these initiatives. So this is a putting very several actors together around a uh, shared priority. Let's go. So we can go, get into detail whether it was microfinancing or it was uh, establishing a specific uh, uh, facility for very excluded sector of population, what it was cash, cash uh, 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 delivery or cash financing to uh, exclude the population. So we can enter into detail, but essentially it's uh, agreeing with different actors with the principle of a private sector, principle of the development of the local level, and the government and international cooperation. This, this, this is what this really refers to. Other, other questions? Sir. Ah, the future of the fund. The fund uh, has been uh, extremely uh, efficient. So it means they spent uh, uh, a lot of almost everything what they had. So there is not much now. Are there, are there <laughs> so why we are closing. Are huh? other, are we are closing. Are there, are there other donors or, or, or what are the... Well, the, the issue is that, uh, that we are in this process. We are in the process to, uh, and this is also part of this process, to make uh, the result of the fund known. We have been so busy in doing things and less concentrating in promoting things. So we'll have this year and the process to post-2015, 2015, just to prove uh, at a wider level uh, the benefit of the fund for different actors to consider. You can, uh, from an analytical or, or research type uh, uh, point of view, as a tremendous development experiment, and they put 900 million 50 countries, 130 programs, there is a wealth of material, of findings, of experiences that might take uh, years, uh, scientific uh, development community to research, to investigate. And actually, we are already uh, getting to some agreement uh, with some uh, uh, academic entities. Well, this is one also, we come from here, but we go to Columbia, Harvard, some uh, other European, where we discuss exactly the innovation and the replicability of this initiative. Definitely, uh, one of the most important innovation is, uh, well, you have party declaration here, you have the UN reform there, you have the MUMDG there, and that the country were free to decide. 
And uh, what was really motivating the country to work was global public opinion and global agreements. But if you see it, the way they do their public policy, MDG were not working to design, were not used to design their public, social public policy. It was a consequence of the social policy. But if you use the MDG to design your public policy, you increase a lot, because it's instrument, it is an instrument to design public policy. So uh, the, the, the wealth that we come out of this experience will be extremely of knowledge, useful for the future. So we have some carefully guarded resources that we will use to promote and uh, share this experience with other people, and particularly with the academy, with practitioners, and with countries, essentially with countries that are the beneficiary for them to talk about the funds and not the fund to talk about itself, essentially. We'll be very happy to share uh, all, the, all the information that we have uh, continue this dialogue. Many thanks. Uh, other comments or questions? This, this woman back here. Thank you very much. And also the other gentleman. And, here, I want to oh, 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 I missed. You okay. Want. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the presentation. I work for the Multilateral Investment Fund, uh, which is a member of the IDB, and I'm a citizen of Spain, so I was very happy to see the good results that we got in Peru. My questions, I have two questions actually. Um, the first one relates to the innovative financing that we just mentioned, because going forward, I, w I wonder if you have thought about innovative instruments. What I mean here is that um, we see that for middle-income countries, we might need something different than grants and concessional loans, but also equity as a way to move forward. And if you've thought about this, the second question relates to the citizen ownership that you had in a slide um, that is very interesting for me because I, I actually find it difficult when you have a lot of indigenous populations to actually give the ownership to the citizens and I, was very, I am very interested in knowing um, what type of mechanisms do you have to actually give the ownership to citizens in this type of very heter heterogeneous um, environment. Thank you. I'm Mr. Lloyd from the University of Maryland. My question is for Ambassador Forsyth. Uh, you made mention that the labor market is uh, very weak in Peru. And concerning college students, yeah, college students who or university graduates who finish the degrees, especially in um, the technical and scientific fields, if they couldn't find jobs, um, are you in the um, business of encouraging these young people to engage in entrepreneurship, engage in business, small medium enterprise, instead of getting employment. And question number two is, uh, do you have tie-ups with uh, European countries uh, concerning your graduate students and uh, uh, to pursue degrees that are very much needed for the development of Peru? Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for for the Spanish colleague for your question because that is a, a, that is a very good uh, question to as, to present express and, and, and clarify what I meant when we, we when I mentioned the difficulty to get nice good public policy designed at national level to really impact on certain sector of population that constitute still the need, the, the, the core of the new uh, important future beneficiary because the exclusion of extreme poverty is there. Naturally, I'm happy that Evelyn De Lobo is here, that she knows very well how to trickle down national policies uh, uh, from national to local level, the difficulties from El Salvador, where she was working there exactly in this issue. Uh, what you mentioned is important because when you talk to the, uh, uh, to the indigenous, the MDGs that don't, doesn't, don't make sense. And with the ACE fund, what we did is, okay, you design your MDGs. So they studied it, and they decided, no, these are not okay. To, to answer, to respond, or to, or, or to get a result on those eight points, we have five, five elements. So we reduce our MDGs, your MDGs, to five elements because they feel that they are disintegrated, disarticulated, isolated, and don't take into consideration culture, 
they don't take into consideration elements that for them are essential to their life, like buen vivir, harmony, and the environment. So you have to accept that you have this uh, element reducing so much poverty, but when you go there, uh, you have to talk, uh, uh, and, and also they say, well, they are individually conceived, not socially or communitarily conceived. So the major element is that for them, the MDGs are conceived like uh, for, to, to uh, uh, benefit the individual as not the community. And they are a community uh, culture. So the same for the Afro-descendant descendant, with a different uh, modality. So you have to change. If you want to address that, talk to the territory, talk to about the uh, 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 harmony with the environment, and uh, in territorial and recognition of that territorial uh, space and autonomy, you have the health, you have the poverty, and you have the governance, and so, so forth. So you have to really to, to change the way you do your public policy. So when you design it, the civil servant at the local level has to enter in a different type of dialogue. So you cannot send somebody from the capital. You really are entering a different culture of applying public policy to the specific audience. Ambassador Forsyth. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, yeah it's true that the, that the market cannot uh, absorb the tremendous amount of professionals that we're having in Peru. And the, the, the case is serious. During the government that I mentioned before, the last decade of the 90s, that dictatorship that we had to endure for so many years, uh, there was an extremely generous approach to allowing universities to, to become legal. So believe it or not, but this is extremely hard to believe, and for me, even harder to tell. We have more than 100 universities in our country. And of course, ours is not such a big country, and ours is not such a big, big market in order to absorb the amount of professional, uh, professionals that, that we have every year. So many of them leave the country, which is absolutely uh, weird. But at the same time, what we don't have are technicians, because everybody wants to become a, a professional that has been sold to the country as the good challenge and the, the idea of developing, as it is in Europe, in Germany, in, in Italy, everywhere, uh, technical careers uh, is not attractive for, for the population. So that poses a problem and the government will have to, to see how to solve that, and soon, in the near future. Uh, and about the other part of your questions, yes, we have agreements with, with universities in, in Europe and the United States, and we try to encourage the best, the real best students with the help of, of the state uh, to, to, to have their postgraduate studies abroad. Actually, uh, President Tumala will be here on the 10th of this month, and one of his most important tasks in his agenda will be education. So he's going to meet with several presidents of well, several universities of the United States, and we're going to sign agreements with them regarding education for postgraduate proven students. But not only that, going back to that matter that the gentleman yeah. mentioned about uh, science and technology, we're going to sign agreements with these universities on science and technology for bilateral cooperation. Actually, I had the tremendous honor to meet with the president of MIT last week in Boston, and we're beginning to do something with them. And President Tomala will, will be traveling to Boston to meet with him, and we're going to sign something with them in that particular matter. I think I'm just sensing, uh, I'm, I'm, what I think is I might ask you, Bruno, to make some, so some last remarks, because I said I'm not sure that I don't see additional, unless there's I'm not sure, are we, are we double dipping? I'm not sure we're double dipping on questions. If you're going to do a, if, if we could do a, 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 we can have, we can have one quick, you can make a quick comment. And, oh, my friend, jo, J, absolute, for JMF, absolutely. My friend Joanna Mendelson Foreman, who's a, a senior advisor here at, at CSIS, we're very fortunate to have her She's involved with the UN Foundation before coming to CSIS. Please, JM, Joanna. Yeah, yeah. I okay. just had a quick question for both of you, because the questions that you're describing, particularly for Latin America, on the gap in education for technically prepared people is not going to be overcome, even with all the agreements that are signed, 
with different universities. It's going to take a generation of at least 20 years to do it. I was going to ask you what you were doing in terms of these mid-level technical schools. I mean, many of us remember, I guess it was Gilberto Freire in Brazil, who, uh, it, was a Freire, it was Freire, but one of, to, who talked about vocational education as being something that was acceptable. And some countries have really developed their vocational school systems to fill that technical gap. How do you see that coming forward in your education plan for you, uh, Mr. Bruno, in the next uh, part of the Millennium Challenge? And for you, Ambassador Forsyth, since Peru is now at a stage which has you know, become a much more developed country and a successful country, how do you see technical education fitting into your development plans to absorb all of these young people who need jobs and need careers? Before we, we get to that, I, want to, I wanted to ask my Ambassador Hil Casares to, to, to speak as well. Um, um, thank you very much. My question was for Bruno Moro. One, one, one of the big challenges all these funds have, and we suffered in Spain, is the accusation of lack of transparency. Now, have you come up with, a, with an evaluation process that would uh, I mean, face that challenge? Thank you. And I see, I see Larry Knowles back there, if you could, we could call him Larry. Um, I'm Larry Knowles with the Hewlett Foundation. This is for uh, Mr. Morrow. Um, I'm, you, you mentioned about one of the achievements of the fund being greater UN coherence and, and the principle or the concept of one UN. And I'm just wondering, do you see evidence of maybe lessons learned by the UN going forward about how uh, this concept could be applied more broadly in, in other areas of their development work? Just, just one real quick one. There was a, there was a, I thought I heard a question from our colleague on the other side of the room specifically about loans and loan guarantees for Bruno and the extent to which they were being used. Um, and I'm just, just, since the three of us are all Kennedy School alums, I figure cut me some slack. Oh, fair enough. I figure we, we, this is World Bank style, where you bunch the questions together to give the give the uh, the participants a chance to think about how they want to answer the questions. So, so why don't we start with perhaps Joanna's question to both of you about education and how we how we deal with the challenge, Ambassador? Well, I, I don't think I I can answer your question properly. What I can tell you is that last week, precisely, I had the chance to to talk to the chairman of our education committee in, in our country. And he was mentioning precisely that problem that you spoke about. So we don't really know what is the government going to, to do about that. What I can tell you is that this congressman uh, mentioned to me that we are in the process of importing, if I can use that word, technicians from other countries in order to work, for instance, in the ports driving these complicated machines, and they're making lots of money doing that. He mentioned the, the case of those who, who lift the, the cargo, uh, and the, their, their salary, which was offered, was around $10,000 per month. So I myself was all, 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 almost ready to offer myself right, right, in order right, to have a chance to, right, right. yeah, to you will join me, yeah. So, so, yeah. Okay, there's so. a flight leaving for <laughs> Lima right after this. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so this is, this is more or less the case, madam, and let's see what comes, comes out of all this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bruno, please. I don't know whether I, what I'm going to say will, will uh, satisfy you, but uh, one thing I uh, for concern the capacity to create jobs for technicians, for people that uh, has, uh, got some education, some skill. I, I think that we uh, should try uh, what we perceive from this experience to make uh, uh, more democratic the economy of their countries. Moses, don't, we, have, we actually we have a window in, in the, our fund which is called democratic govern, economic governance, uh, which essentially is to involve more local actors in establishing uh, how the 
public service will work and how also you promote their economy and their facilities. I think that uh, the small and middle enterprises uh, is uh, a tremendous uh, field for improvement because uh, are the sector that can create the highest number of employment and also can have a stability at the local level, which is unique. But you have to be able to help them to overcome the barrier, the asymmetries, to get access to credit, to uh, education, to marketing, so on and so forth, uh, and which involves a rethinking of the way the state, either central, local, or other institutions are doing this promotion. And internationally, we have tremendous experiences that we can share. By the way, Spain has certain level of uh, sophistication at the territory, at the local level, that actually is absorbing a lot of the crisis that uh, might come from this uh, difficult moment. So in this direction, I think that we need to have to make the economic culture in the region still more democratic and not just big enterprises, uh, CEO, uh, uh, all things. No, we go back to the territory, to the people, small and medium enterprises, they can do very efficient, particularly if they are in change, uh, they are clustering, there is a support and so, so forth. For concern, the uh, greater UN coherence, uh, you have to motivate it. If you don't, who was the gentleman who asked me, okay, if you don't motivate it, uh, uh, in spite of the statement, uh, everybody will prefer to work alone. Uh, so far, there is no much motivation uh, apart from some uh, declarations and so, so forth. There are different elements that uh, uh, are an obstacle uh, on that one. But one of the most important elements which is missing is creating this new window. Funds, investment that go for interagency activities. So in this sense, they are motivated to work together. When the experience that we had with the fund were very difficult at the beginning because everybody wanted, okay, I get my, my slice and I do within my life what I want. There, the uh, role of the resident coordinator was essential. And the fund established, the resident coordinator at the end has only to sign. He doesn't have even the authority to sign normally. That he will get uh, the political accountability on the result. Mm -hmm. So I don't sign easily. Eh? If I don't sign Italy, I have a power or I have an authority. And this authority, I pass it over to the rest of the people. So they, okay, let's do better. The second round was my nicer. The third and the fourth, all other joint programs, even from other funding, source of funding, were done through the governance mechanisms established by the Spanish uh, MDG Trust Fund. So there is a culture you have to go. But if you stop now, you go back to a bad habit. So I think that it's important to pursue this uh, line of action. And with the post-2015, with your help and help other people to say, okay, but we have to entice to go together, not, not just to make statement and to say it in universal declaration. Thank you. Uh, could we, Bruno, could you talk a little bit about this issue of tra transparency and, and, and that the, the, the ambassador mentioned, Ambassador Hilke uh, Yeah, the, the transparency uh, is, uh, is absolutely uh, it's extremely important because you, if you are perceived not to be transparent, you lose all your credibility. If you are, your credibility is the most important asset, not only of people, but of the organization. So we are absolutely keen on transparency. Transparency and accountability at all level, not only in the management funds, the results, and to the people that are involved. So for this, we have uh, uh, involved in a very cumbersome, multi-layered, uh, multi-level uh, uh, exercise of evaluation, national evaluation. Each uh, national program is evaluated by uh, local evaluation. And then we have a global evaluation going on right now that will uh, uh, go through the different aspects of the fund. We have uh, on transparency the governance system of the, of the fund, which is uh, uh, practically is impossible uh, not to be transparent because you have there government, beneficiary, the donor, the agencies, and the resident coordinator at different level from national and territorial level. So it's, a, it's a, an element of a tremendous participatory approach and uh, empowerment of the beneficiary that then they really claim 
or you promise that, you give me that. Otherwise, I don't want to talk to you. Bruno, can I just push you just a little bit further on this issue of transparency? I, I had breakfast this morning to, with a friend of mine who's involved with the Publish What You Fund U.S. initiative. There's a lot of energy in Washington, both out of the World Bank, somewhat, I think, at the IDB as well. Uh, there's been so, It's reflected somewhat in U.S. government policy through something called an assistance dashboard, but it doesn't go as far as what this uh, transparency, uh, aid transparency initiative, IATI, uh, is pushing for, or publish what you, you know, the, the publish your assistance initiatives that are funded by uh, Open Society Institute and, and others. The One Campaign here in Washington has also been a big proponent of this. Are you all signatories to any of that? To that, the uh, Yachty, is that is, is that on your radar screen at all? Has that come up? No. Well, I just joined a month, and I don't uh, perceive that there is uh, anything of that. Okay. But, but, but this uh, is something but, uh, but thank you very much. I yeah, I think get, we should, this uh, is something get, uh, for us to, uh, to pursue off, off, offline. We are interested to having all issues that can uh, work on transparency and be perceived like that. Yeah. So. Uh, will be extremely open on this thing. So let's just let's just come back with this. You may so not transparency and efficiency. Exactly. So exactly. So I, th this may be this may be not. It's not necessarily a fair question for you, as as you've just figured out where the espresso machine is in your office as of a couple weeks ago. But this issue about the issue of loan guarantees and alternate financing mechanisms, it may be that uh, there were that this is the certainly the the FOMIN, which is the organization that the the woman works with, is is working in that. And there's the Development Credit Authority. Certainly, government of Spain has a development finance institution. Historically, the UN agencies have not done development finance type arrangements. Were there any examples of development finance type activities with with the fund that you can that you can think of? And maybe that it, that's not the case, and that you did a lot around policy work to support the support uh, an enabling environment for the private sector, or training for small and medium-sized enterprises, and instead of that sort of activity. We have done something uh, a certain level. I don't have uh, really the whole information. I don't have syst systematize it, but uh, we have done with the private sector certain uh, promotion in this sense. But uh, I commit myself to send you all the information for well, the we're, we're hoping you're going to come back in the fall so we're going to we're going to have the come back for the for the second round of this in the fall hopefully for the new fund exactly the new or, fund. and that for as well fund. exactly exactly well good i think covered a lot of territory today and uh i want to um really uh thank our two speakers uh mr bruno moro and ambassador Forsyth, for being with us before we before we leave, though, I, I would really like Ambassador Hilkasaris to come up here just for a minute to just to just share some reflections with us. It's really uh, the the government of Spain was strategic and really uh, and, and and really courageous in uh, in in making this investment in 2007. And I think it's quite important that the fund um, share its lessons learned. And so, I, Ambassador, please, if you would just reflect from the government of Spain, uh, please. Uh, listen, thank you. It, it, it's so late that my reflections are, very, are going to be very, very short, don't worry. Um, I just want to thank, first of all, the CSIS for organizing uh, this, this uh, uh, seminar on two phases. The first one with uh, lunch on, 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 on Latin America and, and the second one. And I want to thank um, very specially Ambassador Forsyth for uh, having accepted to come and present the, the case of Peru. And, and of course, Bruno Moro for presenting the whole the, 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 this project. Spain, as, as many of you know, um, was a recipient of foreign aid in 1982. So from then on, we've uh, uh, transitioned from from a, 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 I mean, using the, the old uh, terminology from from a recipient to um, to a donor country. And 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 it's through that experience that we've decided um, to come up with this idea of uh, um, fostering multilateralism in as much as we could effective. Uh, um, we've, uh, in, 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 in this last years, um, and, and for the years to come, there's, there's been a, a new uh, development plan. We've concentrated on less areas than before. Basically, it's been Latin America, as you could have seen, North Africa, um, but also Sub-Saharan Africa, especially the uh, ECOWAS region, 
um, which, which of course is, is closer to us. Um, and with the, the uh, following the lines of, of the Paris, the Busan and the Accra um, uh, declaration, we've um, decided to go on, 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 on the line of appropriation, mutual responsibility. But we didn't want to fall on this ongoing debate of whether to uh, concentrate only on, on LDCs, on less developed countries. We, we thought that the, the um, um, middle-income countries um, were not only uh, countries that should, uh, we should concentrate on, on our development policy, but it, we, we would have been short-sightedness not, not to look at them. The, the examples that we've seen in Latin America, and we were speaking about them uh, uh, this afternoon in the lunch, will probably be um, um, very, very, very well applied in, in, in LDCs in other regions, basically in Africa. We, I, I spoke, and I'm not going to do it again, basically we, because we, we're already, uh, I think, two minutes over the time. Um, the, the issue, and if you read all the, the reports of, of uh, Serbia, how the Serbian, a European country, uh, a middle-income country, receive funds, um, they use them um, following the, the method of, 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 um, of, of, of this MDG um, fund in such a way that uh, they're not going to be receiving any more. The project has been, uh, uh, if you allow me the term, embedded into the, into the, the administration of, of Serbia. Uh, and and um, at the end, um, different communities through the 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 the, the, pro the, the, the process of of um, intersexual uh, development, have managed to come up with uh, basis for development in their countries. They did it in in a way that um, I mean, and, and thinking, and, and I'm going to confess here that my experience in Latin America, unfortunately, has not been that large. I'm only in love with Latin America, but I've not worked with in Latin America <laughs> so much. Uh, 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 absolutely, absolutely, and, and and my more Aristotelic love was with Africa, in which I've uh, in which I've worked for ten years. Um, in in um, Africa, many of the examples that have developed in in Serbia could very well be applied because uh, of the different communities. Uh, I know it's a different a, a communities in the former Yugoslavia than the tribes in Africa, but the way uh, this project managed. Uh, um, to um, overcome this, this issue could very well be applied in Africa in, in, in all the LDCs, in all the LDCs. And then one other thing I like about this project very much is that, um, yes, maybe Spain um, put $900 million and maybe it's, it's, uh, it, it was a whole lot of money, and it was a whole lot of money, let me tell you, for Spain, and, and, and we might, might be seeing it now. Uh, but. Uh, but uh, it is true that when you see the, the reports, uh, the figure that comes up is not that one. It's not, it's cost that much. But when you see the reports of the different projects, you have, uh, but even numbered, uh, this has been, uh, this has, has helped to, um, uh, to put into school 325,081 kids. Or uh, this has helped to uh, 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 educate in, 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 I don't know which um, issue, uh, a single number of, so, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a project that, uh, in which you at the end see the people, if you allow me, uh, Bruno, and, and I congratulate you for that, uh, when, when, you, when you read the report. So I encourage you when the report is over, and I don't know if it is yet, or, or to read it, because you see it's a, it's a different type of project, uh, and, and I think of the, um, of the experiences that are going to emanate there, of you are going to be, they're going to be able to apply uh, in, in other projects in, in, in other areas, and, and that's probably the big change of, of these uh, MDG uh, funds. But again, thank you very much, CSIS. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much.